how to get started investing in multifamily properties, part three, so you can quit your job in 90 days or less. And like I said last time, how do you do that? Well, you buy a property that cash flows passively uh, and cash flows net equal to the amount that you're earning in your job so you can quit that job, become a full-time investor, and then make oodles of dollars, which multifamily properties do for you, if you do it properly. So let's do a little bit of review. This is cog number three. Okay, I call it three because investing in multifamily properties comes with three different cogs. All right, cog number one is from the starting to getting your deal accepted. Okay, so all the things that you needed to do, and if you didn't see that video, go back to uh, um, uh, part number one, how to, start, how to get started investing in apartment buildings, and we go all through cog number one, what you need to do to get to that accepted offer. Then we went into cog number two, which is the offer accepted all the way to the closing and all of the things that need to get done there. And today, we're going to go into cog number three, which is you've got this property closed, now it's time to operate that property. All right, at any given time, you want all three of these cogs working, but certainly when you first start out, you've got cog number one working. You know, when you're working to get, uh, you're analyzing deals, you're making offers, and all of a sudden, one of them hits, and cog number two starts. Now, you don't stop cog number one, you're still looking for more deals to do, okay, but cog number two, you've got to go from, from accepted offer all the way down to closing, and then once that's done, cog number two will stop, one continues, and cog number three keeps going, which is operating your deal. At any given time, one and three should always be moving, all right? And you want cog number two to be moving on a regular basis as well. You want deals going to closing. So let's talk about cog number three. What is cog number three? Well, it is, it's, it's uh, we talked about, oh, this quick review on cog number one. That was analyzing the deals, getting deals to analyze, making an offer, negotiating an offer, and offer accepted. So if you didn't see that one, go back. And then cog number two was uh, the deposit money, due diligence, raising funds, purchase and sale agreement, senior debt, the commitment requirement, and then how to lock in the rate. And now that brings us to cog number three, which is actually the operations of the deal, or asset management. And if you saw cog number two and you heard what I said at the end, it's true. You are not a property manager. You are not a property manager. You are an asset manager. Let the property manager deal with the tenants, okay, collect the rents, um, uh, and to... Um, Take their, take their calls, maintenance requests and all that. Uh, let them take the tenant calls and then let them deal with the maintenance issues so they, hire, they have the maintenance men uh, swing the hammers and take out the trash because that's not your job. Your job is, as an investor is to go out and get yourself some more deals, build your portfolio, create generational wealth for you and your family. Okay, so that's why we love our property managers, but we don't want to be a property manager. We want to be asset managers. And in this video, I am going to give you the only tool you'll ever need to ensure that your property creates profits at the end of the month. All right, so let's talk about the three-legged stool. Number one is leasing, number two is collection, and number three is retention. These are the three most important things that your management company must be good at in order for your deal to perform properly. Now, if they're weak in any one of these three areas, you know, if they're weak at leasing and your property is below the expected occupancy rate, you're not going to get the cash flow that you expect. If they're not good at collections and they're not collecting that money in on a regular basis and in a timely fashion, which we'll talk about in a little bit, that's a problem with the property. Uh, that puts the property at high risk. And if you don't have a good tenant retention program, you're spending a lot of money uh, turning units, okay? And tenant turn is our biggest expense. You want to write that down. In this business, tenant turnover is our biggest expense. We want to get that to its lowest level that we can. All right, so when I talked about that one report that you'll ever need, I am going to cover leasing and collections in that report so you, can, so you will see how, um, how that is done, all right? But right here, I want to talk about retention, all right? And, in, and when we talk about retention, when we're in this business, we talk about closing the back door, all right? And in closing the back door, what I mean by that is we want to keep those tenants in as long as possible. The average multifamily tenant will stay for, I think it's 1. Uh, 1.8 years or something like that on average. Of course, it's a one-year lease, so it couldn't, you know, but that's what it is on average. You want to be better than average, okay? You want your turnovers, um, you know, at, at any given time, the number of units that you're going to be turning per year is about 40%, all right? You want to get that as low as possible. If you're up over 50% tenant turns in a year, boy, you're wasting a lot of money in, in turnover costs, all right? So just remember that. Tenant retention is key to keeping profits in the bank. 
All right, so we want to close that, that back door. How do we close the back door? Well, the number one reason that people leave a property is not because of rental increases, which most people think. The number one reason why a tenant will leave a property is because they've had maintenance requests in there and the ownership hasn't gone back and done the maintenance request in a timely manner. Sometimes not at all. And then they start to think that, hey, they don't care about me, so I don't care about them. And then they go, especially the good tenants, you know, the people you're going to lose first when you're not doing maintenance requests on a timely manner are the good tenants. And typically, you know, it's a lot harder to replace a good tenant with an equally good tenant, and it usually doesn't happen most of the time. Usually a less qualified tenant comes in to replace that good tenant. So already you're on a downward spiral in terms of your tenant profile. So um, always remember those maintenance requests should be done in a timely manner. As soon as possible, they should absolutely be acknowledged the same day that, they, that they're requested. So let's say, let's say they come in through the internet, the tenant re uh, a maintenance request. I like to have the office call them and say, hey, we got your maintenance request. You know, in the process of scheduling it, when would be a good time for to send somebody out there? And then everybody's happy. Um, and, uh, and the tenant's certainly happy, and there's no reason for them to leave. Uh, secondly, it's all about community. Community, 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 create a community. When people feel like they're part of something, they will not leave, or they have a harder time leaving. All right. When they don't feel like, when they feel like they're isolated and not part of anything, then you'll you'll start seeing high tenant turnover. So how do we? Oh, let me go over here. So how do we create that community? Well, certainly we have community newsletters that go out on a regular basis. Certainly, um, we'll have tenant events. You know, every every uh, every year, every month, and every year has a holiday except for August, which is my birthday. So uh, that is the holiday we celebrate at the properties. Um, so, but everyone has a holiday, so you can theme, you know, your tenant event on the holiday, all right? Uh, you can do, um, uh, you can do your child ID stuff, you can do blood drives, there's all kinds of things to create a community, but get people involved, use that day center, you know, just have events come in, have people from the outside come in and do performances, just create the community, and when, they, when you create that community, you will have less tenant turnover. And then thirdly, what I like to say is, Treat them like the gold that they are. Your tenants are your gold. They're paying for all of the costs on the property. They're paying down your mortgage every month. You know, they are your cash flow. They're the ones that are giving you the profits at the end of the month, the passive income, because they pay for the management company to do all those jobs that you shouldn't be doing. And you're out there asset managing, looking at the Monday morning report, which is the thing I'm going to go into next. You're asset managing and you're going out and you're getting more deals. And because your tenants are staying longer and you're treating them properly, you have the ability to go out and get more deals. And because your tenants are paying their rent because they want to live in the community, you're able to give you the, your investors the return that they expect to get, maybe even better. So your investors want to be in your next deal and your investors start telling their friends about your deals. You know, and before you know it, that starts to snowball and it's easy to raise money for your deals. And, it all starts right here, right here at tenant retention. Keeping those tenants in, keeping them paying, um, and treating them like the gold that they are. So just know that. I remember one time I had a, when I first started, you know, I was in a one bedroom apartment, and uh, I started my business out of that. And we had, uh, you know, I had those, those small multis. You know, when I just, uh, uh, last video, I talked about the fact that, you know, I, uh, you know, I had bought, bought one, I think it was this video. I bought one, and then within three months I had three. Within six months I had nine. So we had a bunch of small three to six unit properties in a very short period of time. And I remember, you know, walking up the stairs to my apartment, which where my office was. It was a three three room apartment. One of the, the living room I turned into my office, living room, kitchen, bedroom. And my secretary was in there. Um, all the guys were out doing jobs, and uh, I heard her screaming at somebody. And I walked up and I said, "Who are you screaming at?" And they said, "Oh, it's uh, it's so and so, a first floor Warren Ave." And I was like. What were you screaming at her for? Oh, she wanted this, and she didn't get it rented on time. And blah blah blah. I'm like, I'm like, why are you screaming at her? That you know, those the, the tenants are our gold. And I just explained to her what I explained to you. And I said, if I ever walk up these stairs again and hear you talking to another one of my tenants, you won't be able to work for me anymore. T t talking to them like that, and she changed her attitude, which was good. All right, so let's go into the only report that you will ever need to asset manage your property properly. And that is called the Monday Morning Report. That's what I've always called it. 
Now, there are some management companies that will do this report, and there are some management companies that won't. And the management companies that, that are familiar with this report and know it, they may not call it the Monday morning report. I've heard other names for this report, um, but we've always called it the Monday morning report. I, and I don't even, I, you know, some of them make sense when they call it something else. And uh, I had one management company call it the WUDA. I was like, the WUDA? Because I was explaining, it's like every, every week we want to have what's called the Monday morning report. We, these are the things that we want to see on it. And I'm like, oh yeah, we call that the WUDA. I was like, oh, that's interesting. I wonder where you got that name. So if a management company won't give you a Monday morning report, this report is so, um, so important that you don't hire that management company. If they're not willing to take the time to give you this weekly report to really understand what's going on with the property, that means they don't know what's going on with the property, number one, so they're not going to manage effectively for you. But number two, they work for you, okay? And always remember that. Your management company works for you. And if they won't do it, psh, move on. Okay, so let's go into this Monday morning report and why it's so important and what information it gives you. All right, so this is the way it goes. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to list out all the items in this report all right, and explain why they're there. So the first thing you see at the top is what's called occupancy today. So you'll know, you know, what are we ocup occupied at? Are we at 94, 95, 92%? All right, and, and what were we last week? So how does this compare? Are we up or are we down? All right, that's, that's the quick one. And then we look at the number of pre-leases for the next 30 days. So these are the num number of people that have come into the property, seen it, filled out an application, were approved, and now they're scheduled to move in within 30 days. All right? We also want to look at the number of, of current tenants that decided that, hey, I don't want to live here anymore, so I'm giving you my notice. So we want to know the number of people that are leaving or plan on leaving in the next 30 days as well. And knowing those two numbers, we'll know what the projected occupancy is going to be 30 days out. So if we're at, say, 93% occupied today, and I look at the 30 days out occupancy and I see it at 89%, that means there's a whole lot more notices than there are pre-leases coming in. So it's like, why? What's going on? But, but more importantly, what this does is it gives us the opportunity over the next 30 days to fix that. So when we get the profit and loss statement, that's not the time when we say, what happened? Right? No. We say, what's happening on Monday? Fix it. So when we get the profit and loss statement, we say, yes profits, because that's what we're looking for. So that's the top of the report. Now, not only do we do 30 days, but we also do this for 60 days as well, and we look far out there. Pre-leases for 60, pre uh, notices for 60, and occupancy for 60 days out. Um, and again, that gives us a full 60 days to rectify a problem if it's a problem. Um, and if it's not a problem, you're just happy. It's like, hey, this property's performing very well. You know, we got a good team in place here, and we're very happy. Move on to the next property or move on to whatever else you're doing in your life. Next, we're going to take a look at the number of maintenance requests. Remember we talked about maintenance requests? They're, that, they're so important, they're on the Monday morning report. And we want to see the number of maintenance requests completed. That should be 100%, 95 to 100%, because typically there'll be a maintenance request for something that you may have to order something, you know, a part or a countertop or something. You know, it takes a little time to come in. So you should, at any given time, be between 95 and 100% of maintenance requests completed. And the ones that roll over, I want to know what's rolling over and, and when the completion date is. All right? So I want to know that they're getting done timely and nothing is falling through the cracks. So the next thing you want to look at is the number of units that need to be made ready. And we say made ready, it means that somebody moved out, the team has to go in, prep it, for the new tenant coming in, some repairs, you know, it's making it ready for the new tenant. You know, sometimes they're easy, it's called an easy turn, and it just needs maybe some touch up and, you know, it's the carpet cleaned. Uh, sometimes it's a medium turn, and there may be a problem with some carpet stains or, um, you know, the countertop might need to be replaced. Um, sometimes it's a hard turn, you know, which means that uh, it needs a whole new cabinet system, um, um, or, you know, there's, there's a, a bigger repair that needs to be done to the unit. And then sometimes there's what's called a down unit. A down unit usually either had a fire in it or it had a septic problem. And that's got to be fixed and it's going to take some time before we get uh, another tenant in there. But the most important thing, thing is we need to know the number of units that need to be made ready. All right. And then from the previous week, we want to know how many units were actually made ready. So we want to know the progress. One of the things you want to watch at your, at your buildings is the fact that if they're only doing easy turns, okay, and they're leaving the hard turns and the medium turns out there, you know, so they can, so they can put more on the market, you want to make sure that, that that property is not cannibalizing itself. And what I mean is, if they're doing easy turns or even a medium turn, 
you know, and let's say they, they do a turn and it needs a stove. So they go to a unit that's a hard turn or a down unit and they take that stove out so they don't have to have that invoice go through and it's not an expense. So the ROI looks bigger. All right. So let's say that it, you know, uh, most of these uh, unit layouts are the same. So maybe it needs a fridge, so they get a fridge from somewhere else. Maybe it needs a countertop, so they take the countertop off. Maybe it needs a whole cabinet system, and they take the cabinet system from a down unit, which makes that, that down unit or that hard turn even harder. Make sure that's not happening at your property. Keep this in the back of your mind uh, because this is a problem. And some management companies do this. You know, it, it's not a management scam, um, but what it is, is it's management company inefficiencies to make them look better. It's a way of making them look like they're doing their job better, but they're actually not. Uh, so just know that. Um, so number of made ready and also number of units ready to occupy right now, okay? In all the years I've been doing this, you know, since 1996, this is a very weird phenomenon. We'll have this great leasing team out there, which they lease up. You know, they're just, they're, they're cracker jack. They're leasing up on a regular basis. You know, their occupancy rate's always high. And then all of a sudden, okay, leasing stops. And it's like, why did leasing stop all of a sudden? How come we're not leasing? Well, the reason it stopped is because there wasn't a unit made ready for somebody to move into. And for some reason, there's this psychological phenomenon that takes place that once there's not a unit ready to, to move into, the leasing agents just can't lease anymore. I don't know what it is. It's just one of those things that I've seen through the, all the years, and I've talked to you know, different people in our mentorship program and our, uh, our different students through the years, and we all see the same thing. It's the, it's the, uh, the non-make-ready phenomenon. So just know that. Always have one unit ready for rent. Of course, if you're at 100%, that only means one thing. It means it's time to raise your rent, right? All right. So um, we already talked about number of down units. We talked about cannibal, cannibal, cannibalization, but... That number of down units needs to be on there so you're made aware every week that you got a down unit or you got a couple of down units and you want to know what the plan is to get that unit back online because that is costing you money. All right. Also, and this, this is still the Monday morning report going down, we want to know the number of traffic. So what do we mean by traffic? We want to know the number of people that have come into this uh, property and said, hey, I'm interested in leasing. So the leasing agent takes the person out and says, hey, these are our units, check it out, all right? And then from the number of people that came in, we want to know how many of these people actually converted over to an application. They said, yeah, I, wanna, I like this place. I want to I wanna fill an application. I want to move in. Now, the ratio between the number of people that have come in and the number of people that were converted over to an application should be 30% or higher. Write that down. It's an important number. 30% or higher. Uh, because that means that your leasing agents are doing a good job at converting them to an application. If they're less than that, they're going to need some training from the management company um, uh, or they need a new leasing agent because 30% is like the industry norm. And then when you go to application, it's how many of these applications were actually approved. All right? Yeah, they can fill out the application, but that doesn't mean they're going to be approved. So the ratio there is 75%. 75% of those applications should be approved, and if they're not, if it's less than that, that means that wherever you're marketing, you're marketing to the wrong places or you're marketing to the wrong demographics. You're bringing the wrong traffic into the property because they're converting to an application, but they're not being approved to live on the site. So know that. These are, like, these are the little nitty-gritty things to know about as you're, as you're asset managing your property because when each one of these numbers are off a little bit, okay, when they're all in line where they should be, it takes you five minutes to read that report. It's like, beautiful. And then you move it aside. But if they're not off, okay, then it's time to drill down in that one or two areas where they're not, the numbers aren't right. And you drill down um, and in doing that, uh, you can rectify the problem. So at the end of the month, you have those profits. All right. So let's go into the amount collected. All right. So the very, now this is at the very bottom of the report now. And we're looking at each week, and it's month by month, how much was collected the first week of the month, the second week of the month, the third week of the month, and the fourth week of the month, all right? Um, we want to know below that how much is collected and how much is outstanding, all right? And then below that, we want to know the, the percentage amount that's collected so we have an idea of, of how much more we got to go. Now, the golden rule of collections is that 90% or more should be collected by the 15th of the month. You want to write that down. 90% or more should be collected by the 15th of the month. Why? Because anybody that goes closer and closer to the 30 days, they're at risk at not paying at all. Once they get the 60 days behind, 
forget about it. Write them off. Get them out of there. Buy them out because they're not going to pay you. So you've got to mitigate that risk at day 15. You don't want people going between day 15 and day 30 if you can help it. Okay. Not only that, if your collections are constantly behind on a property and they're coming in between 15 and 30 days, all right, that means your management company is focused on site. They're focused on collections through most of the month. All right? Instead of the first two weeks, they're focused on it for the entire month, which means that they're not doing the other things that they need to do to have that property run efficiently. So that is a key number, 90% collected by the 15th of the month. And that right there is your Monday morning report. Um, and, and knowing that Monday morning report, knowing those numbers and seeing it every Monday and reading, reading it for like five minutes, okay, does a couple of things. Number one, it tells you if there's a problem on the property. All right? And if there's a problem on the property, you immediately call the management company and drill down and say why, okay, and what are we going to do to fix it, all right? So what does that do? That tells the management company that you're actually minding the store because if you're not minding the store, they're not going to mind the store either and there's a higher chance that your property is not going to be running as efficiently um, as it should be, which means you're not going to make as much money as you should be on a property. So this is the beauty of the Monday morning report. You see it every Monday. You see if there's anything you need to dial into. If not, management company is as efficient. They're doing good. Everything's good. You just move on either to the next property. Uh, eventually, you get a portfolio. It's like boom, 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 boom. Read the reports. Um, uh, dial in where you have to, and then you're done. Um, and then you go on with whatever else you're doing in your life. Um, so that's why I call this the one tool, the only tool that you need to run efficiently. So after that, though, we do keep score, and in keeping score, we look at the profit and loss statement at the end of the month, all right? Uh, manage that uh, Monday morning report efficiently, and you will be happy with the profit and loss statements you see at the end of the month. Um, do you're going to tie that into the rent roll. The, the one thing I look at the rent roll is on the far right-hand side is that's the amount of rent outstanding for any particular tenant. Tenant name over here, what unit they're in, you know, a lot of other information going all the way over here, how much outstanding. Right, so in my head, I know I'll look and see how much it is for rent. Say it's seven hundred dollars a month for rent. I look on that column over there, and I start seeing fourteen hundreds, which means they're two months behind. I am very concerned. I see any with seven hundred, you know, and it's like after the fifteenth of the month. I'm very concerned. So those are that's what I'm looking for when I'm looking at the rent roll. Primarily is who's behind and how much, um, and then a variance report. Every year you're going to do a budget with your management company. You're going to determine, you know. Um, what the property is going to run on, uh, income and expenses. And then anytime that it's 10% above or 10% over, you want to be notified. Okay, Within 10%, that's fine. But over or above, we call that an outlier. You need to know the outliers and the reason why for the outliers um, because that will help you run your property more efficiently. So three cogs, the review. Cog number one, start to the accepted offer. Cog number two, offer to the closing. Cog number three, operations. So as you can see, operations is really run by the Monday morning report and, 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 your, um, and your property managers, okay? So it's the Monday morning report that actually controls your property managers for you. The cog number one, the start to the offer, that's where you come in. That's where your relationships with your, your brokers, your direct mail campaigns, uh, the things that you're doing to bring in deal flow on a regular basis and underwriting. If you saw video number one, you know I talked about if you're a right-brainer, get a left-brainer on your team or a partner that loves to do underwriting. So you can be the person that goes out and talks to the people while they're the people that do the numbers, and together, you know, you can build a pretty good business. Um, and then step number two is the offer to the closing, which is the primary part of that is, is this really the deal that we thought it was um, when we put the offer in with the seller? And if not, it's time to retrade. If it is, let's move to the closing table, let's go into the operations, let's put this in our portfolio, and let's get COG 1 and 2 uh, continue to work again. All right, now let's talk about how to be successful. All right, I've been teaching this since 2002. We have thousands of people come through here. We have had students that starting with nothing now own over a billion dollars worth of properties. They have it under management uh, for their companies. Um, and I have seen people become very, very successful. I have seen people go from uh, nothing to being successful to where they want to be, and then they pretty much quit life. I call it quitting life, right? First you quit your job, and then you quit life. And quitting life is just basically doing what you want to do, when you want to do it, with who you want to do it, and for as long as you want to do it, right? It's following your passions, really. It's having enough money and passive income coming in, knowing that your equity is building uh, every year, so that instead of living in scarcity, you're actually living in abundance, and you're just chasing those things that you love to do. And that's what, that's what loving life is all about. Um, 
And so I've seen people do that. They'll get to a certain point, and that's their number. And then they quit life, and they're off. Uh, they have their properties. They, they do their asset management, but they're off doing their things. Um, and then I have people that don't succeed at all. You know, they get started. They follow the exact same systems that the other people follow, but yet they never do their first deal. They get knocked out of the game. Or they get knocked out of the game within their first three deals, which is the most common thing, by the way. Your first three deals are you're probably, uh, once you get the first one done, if you get it done, okay, the first three are you're, you're probably the riskiest because that's where you really haven't built your real estate guts yet. That's where you really need good systems in place. Use other people's systems. Use our systems, systems in place to know that, you know what's going on with a particular property at any given time and to make it sure that you're getting into the right deals. Usually when a deal fails, you know, when the first three deals, you never should have done that deal in the first place. It's just getting into that deal just wasn't right. The numbers weren't right. There, was, there were things wrong with the property that you overlooked or didn't know, hadn't built your real estate gut, didn't understand the deal. Um, but this is, what, this is the difference between the people that are doing a billion dollars uh, in assets under management to those that have quit and are, are loving their lives uh, to those that, are, that, are, that came and went in the business. And that is crushing your limiting beliefs. That's what it is. See, we all have limiting beliefs. I have them. I had the I had this worthiness belief, you know, unworthiness belief for a long time. I grew up, uh, um, you know, lower middle class. Uh, always struggled. Lived in scarcity. Thought life was scarcity, um, until you know I asked one simple question: Why not me? You know, when other people had all these other things, you know, why not me? So I figured out, you know, if if it was going to be me, I started having to think to myself, how do I get this done? If I want it, how do I do it? And that changed everything. Okay, so the first thing about crushing your limiting beliefs is you have to recognize them. And you can go on Google and you can put in, how do I crush my limiting beliefs? And that will help you identify your limiting beliefs. It will also give you strategies on how to do it. But the very most important thing is the first step, which is recognizing your limiting beliefs, all right? And then shifting over to not accepting them. And then it goes from, limiting beliefs are scarcity and then it goes into abundance. So that's the first thing. Because, you know, you can, we can share with you all the business skills for building a multifamily real estate portfolio here at Ari Mentor, and we've done that. We've created billion dollar portfolios. Um, but it's a combination of business skills and mindset skills that get it done. So always know that. And for me, you know, I wasn't successful until I hit my mid-20s because I was a crazy kid doing these crazy things in a rock and roll band. You know, and it wasn't until I started listening to Earl Nightingale from the 1950s. He was dead by the time I started listening to him. But he had this uh, tape set, which you can get on YouTube for free now, uh, called Lead the Field. I listened to that. I started doing what it said. And oh my gosh, it worked. It actually started working. So then I started, uh, I read Tony Robbins' uh, um, Awaken the Giant Within, which happened to come out way back then at that time. And that's on YouTube right now. Uh, and I listened to that and I did what it said and it worked. And I was like, wow. Then I started on this mindset journey that just hasn't ended. You know, uh, Ed Milet, he's got a great podcast right now. He spoke at one of our recent events. Um, and you just start listening to Ed. I've had some friends just say, I just say, listen to Ed. You know, and I've watched the metamorphosis. I've watched them change. So you want to be feeding yourself on a regular basis, um, you know, mindset stuff. Because you're, this is this book called um, Super Brain written by a Harvard professor, and it basically says your mind will automatically default to the negative, okay, unless, well, it's not even unless, it will default to the negative, and you need to have uh, systems in place, tactics in place, to bring it over to the positive. First neutral, then positive. So these are three different names that you can start looking at, but and remember, it's a lifetime journey as well. Uh, there's a great book out there by a Navy SEAL called Unbeatable Mind, which I love. Um, there's uh, another great book written in the 1950s called The Power of the Subconscious Mind, which will help you to, you know, most of your programs are in your subconscious. It will help you reprogram yourself to be successful. Um, and look up the 12 laws of the universe and read them, study them, and, um, and understand them. And these things right here will help you not only to be successful as a real estate investor, but to be successful at anything in life. And that is my wish for you, to be successful. By the way, if you like this, hit the subscribe button and uh, you'll be notified of future videos.